we're all just little bitty cogs doing our little bit in this, but it's also very rewarding when we can do a job that we know is important and is going to have an effect on people and things are going to happen because of what we're doing. All that really gave me the confidence going forward in my art career that I could do it. Welcome to Flip Your Script, the podcast about life's critical turning points and how people find the inspiration and motivation to move forward and rewrite their unique stories. Flip Your Script is produced by Media Minefield, a public relations firm passionate about the power of sharing stories. Specializing in earned and social media, Media Minefield helps clients take control of their unique story and message. The show is hosted by Christy Peel, founder and CEO of Media Minefield, who flipped her script from an Emmy-winning journalist to a successful entrepreneur and speaker. When you think naval officer, what comes to mind? And then when you think artist, what kind of person do you think of? Well, today's Flip Your Script story is pretty dramatic because this guest has found success both in war zones and art studios. He even created art while serving in Afghanistan, and you can see the result because Skip Rohde's work is in the permanent collection at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. Skip, I'm so glad you're going to share your story on the podcast today. Welcome. Thank you very much, Christy. I'm glad to be here. I want to start just by thanking you for your service. You spent decades serving on behalf of our country. Thank you for doing that and for putting your life on hold to serve for us. Thank you for saying that. I do appreciate that. So you have this kind of crazy flip your script professional story on paper. It sounds crazy (laughs) from, you know, artist to soldier, I mean, back and forth. But then really, if we look at the threads of your life, You've been an artist your whole life. So let's start at the beginning as a child. When did you know that you were an artist? I've always known that. Uh, My parents told me that when I was really young, they had to put butcher paper up on the walls because I was always drawing on them. And I just have always been uh, drawing uh, of some sort. Uh, And my parents signed me up for art lessons starting in about the fifth grade. I believe it was, and just continuing on through high school. Uh, Then when I went off to college, I started off in engineering and plunked out at the end of my sophomore year and then worked for a while and then went back to school to study fine art and then switched again back to engineering for a variety of reasons and, uh, and went on. So even when I was in engineering, I was always taking art lessons. And oddly enough, when I was an art major, I was taking engineering classes, too. So (laughs) it's funny because those two parts of the brain, people often don't think that one person can be functioning in both spheres. But you manage to always have a way to do both. I've always gone back and forth between the left brain and the right brain. That's just the way my, my brain functions. And so I'm still doing that today, actually. So. That's, uh, that's, that's what I do. So you have this passion for art. You're talented at it. And when you're in college and, and right out of college, I imagine people said to you, but Skip, how are you going to pay your bills? Artists are broke. <laughs> what did you think about that? Well, when I was in college the first time, this was way back in the 70s, and I never really wanted to go into art as a profession back then. Uh, I had had some experience with doing commissions with people asking me to do things. And it it never really floated my boat. It was kind of like an imposition. Uh, But engineering was more interesting from a work standpoint. So uh, I was I, I went in that direction. But the question you're raising about how you're going to make a living at it really didn't come in until much later in my career uh, when I left the military and uh, became an artist. So actually, if you remember a a comic strip that used to run a long time ago called Family Circus. Oh, sure. um, Yeah. They had this recurrent theme where 
the mom would tell the kid, hey, go check the mail. You know, and the mailbox is like 15 feet from the front door. But the kid has to go climb a tree, ride a bike, and throw the stick for the dog, and go play with the neighbor kids, you know, go all over the neighborhood before finally getting to the mailbox. That's kind of been my life. So (laughs) it's just kind of going in different directions, having it, having a goal uh, in mind, but being open to other possibilities as they came along. So that's kind of what happened with my college career the first time around. Uh, And then that's kind of how I wound up in the Navy and everything that's happened since, actually. It's so fascinating that you described it that way. That's a great way to describe it, because I think a lot of people, (laughs) especially people younger, think that, okay, I'm declaring that I'm going to do whatever. And then there's a straight, easy, very paved, simple path, and everything is going to fall into place, and then I will achieve said goal. That's most people, that isn't their experience. And yours isn't just that it wasn't a straight path. Like your path took you to Afghanistan, which is more than just climbing a tree and taking a break. What was what was that like to expect, you know, engineering and art and you love these things, but then the military path and actually seeing some really tough stuff? Well, uh, actually, Iraq and Afghanistan, I went to those two countries Uh, well after I had already retired from the Navy. So what I did was, when I was in college the first time, I was was a senior, I was looking around for, okay, what am I going to do now that I'm about to graduate from college? And, you know, I hadn't really thought the engineering thing through because when I started job interviewing, everybody wanted me to sit at a desk. And I'm thinking, oh, I don't want to do that. So then I was talking with the Navy recruiters I'd never really been interested in before because this was post Vietnam and I was a long haired hippie kid and the Navy was saying, Hey, we can put you on ships. We can put you on submarines. We can put you on airplanes. We can send you to Europe. We can send you to Asia. And I said, that sounds like it's right up my alley. So this was one of the times I got distracted from, uh, you know, going to the mailbox. So, (laughs) and, and went in the Navy and then, I wound up doing all kinds of really interesting things. And every time I would start thinking about leaving the Navy and uh, going and doing something else, they would offer me something else. And I said, why don't you go over here and do this? And it's like, wow, that sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. So I keep right on going. And then when that came to an end, I said, go over there and do that. Oh, that sounds cool. So after about 15 years in the Navy, uh, the wife and I looked at each other and said, well, you know, I've kind of got a career going here, so I may as well stick it out for several more years. And, but what are we going to do after the Navy? And uh, at that time, I was stationed uh, at Fort Meade outside of Washington, D.C. And that was when I decided, you know, one thing I can do that nobody else can do quite like me is be an artist. So that was a deliberate decision there. And I decided, well, I need to get serious about it. You know, I, while I was in the Navy, I had been taking classes here and there and workshops and things like that, just kind of keeping my hand in a little bit. So at that time, I got serious and I started taking evening classes at Maryland Institute College of Art up in Baltimore. And, um, and kept that up and really learned a lot uh, from there. Um, then I got transferred to uh, Japan, for, and that turned out to be my last duty station. I was getting towards the end of that one and looking ahead at, okay, what's going to be next after Japan? I was in kind of a small field, and I could see the Pentagon looming larger and larger in my windshield. And it's like, I really don't want to go to the Pentagon. And if you have any uh, military members out there, you're going to see a lot of heads going up and down on that one. So I retired at the end of that, and that was after 22 years of service. At that point, we uh, we took several months off and bummed around Europe and then came here to the Asheville area. We had already 
been here and looked it over. I like the school here, the University of North Carolina at Asheville. And we like really like the area. So so we moved here and I started at UNC Asheville uh, in the fall of 2000 and uh, and got a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from there in 2003 and then became an artist. So that's how, that's the quick and dirty on how I made the transition from military to becoming an artist. And then going from artist to Iraq and Afghanistan, well, that was a little, that was different. Before uh, we go yeah, there, I want sure. to back up. You said a couple okay. really interesting things. So you said a lot of interesting things. A couple things I want to dig into. While you were sure. making money and having a career, you kept your passion yeah. alive. And I think that's something that is really yes. critical because you can't set the passion aside and then say, well, someday when I retire, I'll get to whatever the passion is, and then I'll be good at it. I mean, you have to continue to practice it. How did you find time in a submarine or wherever part of the world you might have been? How did you find time to keep working on your craft? Well, they were usually just evening classes. For example, I was in San Diego, and I was studying etching with, with an artist there and it was just a regular Wednesday night thing, you know, you just show up. So when when duty called, you know, the Navy comes first. So that's just the way it was. So uh, I usually had a place in around the house where I had my art stuff. Uh, and sometimes it would just sit for maybe a couple of years in between really being able to do anything. And then when I was stationed in shore duty, then I usually had the opportunity to go out and do life drawing sessions or take a class or something like that. It was just, you know, art is just something I have to do. There's not much more to say about it than that, really. It's, it, uh, and my wife will tell you, if I'm not able to do something creative after a while, I, I start bouncing off the walls, you know, so um, uh, it's just something I do. It's wonderful that you never set that off to the side in a way that you compromised who you are, because I think there's mm -hmm. a lot of really unhappy people out there who, for some reason or another, feel like they have to, you know, whether it's grow up or sacrifice some really key part of them so that they can be someone else. I think that just doesn't lead to a very fulfilled life. So I love hearing you talk about how you, how you, did it. And you also continue to get better at it because that's important too, that you continue to grow and take classes and get some formal training. So you could continue to feed the passion. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I said, it was something that I had to do. And so, and I, I wanted to do it as well as I, it wasn't something that I was going to set aside or that I was really going to let degrade, you know, although sometimes th there were times when I did have to set it aside for a while, depending on the assignment. But, you know, even then I was always doodling in notes in these really boring meetings that I had to sit in, that sort of thing. So it was always, always there somewhere. That's great. So then after you do your first career, <laughs> You've had a few, you've had a lot of careers, Skip. So you do, you do your first career. <laughs> uh -huh. Your path to the mailbox is very long and very windy. So you, <laughs> you do your first career. You then are back in school and now you're in North Carolina uh -huh. and you're, are you 40 something at this point? Yep. Late forties. What's it like to be in college as a late 40 year old? I loved it. I was a little nervous at first, you know, I'm going to be the old guy on campus. And it turned out I wasn't the old guy on campus. There were a lot of others who were college retreads, you know, or late bloomers or whatever. There were a lot of us older ones there. And the younger kids accepted us, you know, as long as we didn't, you know, lord it over. And you know, when I was your age, you know, I was learning as much from the other kids as as I was from the teachers. And UNC Asheville has a really 
really good program. It's a, a liberal arts college that lets you focus on specific things. Like in my case, it was painting. In others, you could maybe theaters or English or you know a variety of other things. It, uh, it's a really strong program. And I found I really liked that liberal arts approach because it combined so much that I had seen in the wild, you know, in, in the world. But, you know, having an engineering background teaches you that things are logical, you know, and you get out in the world, things aren't logical. And, and the liberal arts education there really broadened my scope. And it was so much fun and challenging and very, very challenging. And I thought the fine arts program would be something I wouldn't have any problem with. And I had a lot of problem with it there, primarily in finding my way. What was my voice going to be? What was I going to focus on? How was I going to work? What kind of paintings was I going to make? That was, uh, that turned out to be very difficult because it requires going deep inside and really um, doing a lot of self-examination and understanding yourself. And that's a very difficult process. That's the hard work that a lot of people don't want to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And if you don't do it, well, if, if you don't do it in the art world, it shows in your art. And I imagine, I'd never really thought about it that way, but if you apply it to life and a lot of other professions, I imagine it shows up there too. It's so interesting that you talked about how much fun it was to go to college, even though scary, but you know, growth happens when we're afraid and we push through it. How many people say, you know what, I'm in my 40s or 50s or 60s. I'm not going back to school. And I loved hearing you talk about how, what a fulfilling and challenging experience that was for you, because it really set you up for careers three and four. Yes, it did. It, it just opened my eyes to all kinds of new things. And it, like I said, it was, you know, being around these imaginative, uh, creative people was just a who. So it, it was a lot, uh, it was very challenging I got into all kinds of things. Uh, I had to take an anthropology class and we had to do a project out of that. And I wound up, because of that, I wound up working with Meals on Wheels for several years, you know, maybe about what four years, something like that. That was very rewarding in itself and, and as well as interesting. And I found a lot of people that I could use in my artwork. So when you're pushing into and leaning into these new experiences and new opportunities and new adventures. Was there something Mm -hmm. that you learned in the military that gave you the courage to be uncomfortable? That's an interesting question. I think probably self-confidence. When I was in college back, when I was a young kid back in the seventies, I didn't really have very much self-confidence, but the Navy throws you into the deep end and you know you're it it assigns you jobs that you have first place no idea even even exist and second uh you know it's like what me do that you know Uh, so i had been in the navy about a year and i was uh, driving a uh, a surface warship uh, around the western pacific and uh, later, I was managing a multi-million dollar high technology development program. I mean, we were literally writing the text on that, you know, and I didn't know anything about it, really. I was just managing the program. I had experts uh, on the team who were figuring it all out. I just made sure that we were going forward, you know, so it was things like that. Uh, I had and going off to uh, war zones, like uh, I was over in Bosnia in 96 as part of the peacekeeping forces and, and seeing what happens on the ground in a conflict zone. You know, in the, in the Navy, we don't really get to see that very often. We're way out at sea. Um, but on the ground, you're in these villages that have just been utterly destroyed. And, you know, it's like, wow, this this is what happens on the receiving end of our gunfire or our missiles or or whatever, you know, we didn't do that destruction. They did it to themselves in Bosnia, but, uh, you know, it was very, just very eye opening. Um, all those experiences there. And like I said, I was, I got to be 
part of things that were just so much bigger than me. You know, when you see a huge group of ships out at sea or or you're on in some kind of a large operation, you know, you're looking around and there's thousands of people uh, in this and we're all just little little bitty cogs doing our little bit in this, but it's also very um, rewarding when when we can do a job that we know is important and is going to have an effect on something, you know, on, on people and things are going to happen because of what we're doing. So uh, all that really gave me the confidence going forward in my art career that I could do it. There's a lot of wisdom in that. And I wouldn't have thought that an experience in the military would teach you. (laughs) I've watched plenty of, you know, military movies and shows. And I I have some friends that have been in the military. But to hear you say it that way, it just, it really was enlightening. It, it It made a lot of sense. And what a gift to have your mind at such a young age. Being uncomfortable became your normal. And experiencing things and being part of something bigger just became a, a fabric of who you are. So then you couldn't separate that then when you're re- you've retired to say, okay, well, now I'm just going to sit around and do nothing and I can be bored and I don't need to push myself because that, that isn't who you are. That isn't how you spent decades of your life. Well, that's true. That's true. And what you just said, I hadn't really thought of it that because the Navy kept pushing me, I got used to being, uh, to pushing myself. And, and so that applies to my artwork, you know, like even today, I'm, when I'm working in the studio, I'm pushing myself to make my paintings better. But that, that same approach is still with me. You know, I got, it got beat into me by all the people that I had to work with and compete against in the Navy. And thank goodness, because your art is really good. I mean, I, I've been to the website. I've looked at it. Uh, you know, it says the Smithsonian, so they don't they don't take bad art. And we'll put you know we'll put links to all of this on the Flip Your Script podcast website as well. So we have you in college. You're in college. You finish, and then you're going to make money doing art, and then you end up back in the military. So talk us through that and how, and then that leads you back to the mailbox where you are today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I, I got out of UNCA and I set myself up in Asheville's River Arts District and I said, okay, I am now a professional artist and that's what I need to do. So I was working away down there and started, you know, I was, I was doing a lot of paintings that I was putting up for sale and I was going off to art festivals. You know, I, I had a tent and display equipment and was uh, going different places around the East to these different festivals, which was really a lot of fun, but I wasn't selling my artwork and I couldn't figure out why. So I started looking around at, okay, what is selling? And maybe I can put some of that into my work too. And so I'd see a little bit and I'd make some changes and then make some more artwork and it wouldn't sell. And so I'd say, well, let me try something else. So I got sucked into the selling idea that, you know, you have to sell to be a professional artist. And this lasted for, oh, I don't know, maybe a year, two years. And it really got bad. Um, I mean, uh, I was painting stuff that I didn't like with the idea that other people would like it and it wasn't fun and I was having a miserable time and I was actually thinking of just throwing it all up and uh, and finding a job somewhere. And then uh, I was in a uh, a marketing seminar and there was a woman there who works with artists to help them find their way. She's a wonderful lady, Wendy Outman here in Asheville. Um, And she started off her presentation by saying, what is it you really want to do? And I heard that and just had this, you know, I just tuned out the rest of the, of the seminar because I thought, Hmm, what am I doing here? You know, I'm, I'm doing what I want to do, which is making art, 
but I'm not making the art that I want to make. And I really had to think about that for a couple of months as to how I was going to shift this. And eventually I found a direction. I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Let's, you know, this, this is something that really gets my, uh, uh, gets me excited. And I'm going to do, uh, I'm, I'm going to paint these kind of paintings and see what happens. And as soon as I did that, my paintings immediately got much better. I mean, they were, composition was better. The, the way they were painted was better. The stories they told were better. They, it was just immediately much better. The, they started getting into some rather exclusive jury shows. They started winning awards. It was much better. They still weren't selling, but they were much better artworks. So at that point, I started thinking, hmm, okay, so maybe what I need to do is to separate income producing activities from art making activities. And that way, what I can do is to make the things that I want to make. And if, uh, if other people want to buy them, great, but I don't rely on that. So that's what I did. And that indirectly led me to going to work first in Iraq in 2008, that I had been looking for a part-time job at that point. And I was listening to NPR one day and heard, heard somebody on the radio talking about the State Department in Iraq. And I thought, hmm, maybe, maybe I can do some work with them. And so I started looking into it. About a little less than a year later, I was, I was a temporary State Department officer in Iraq, uh, still as a civilian. So I, I didn't go back in the military. I was over in Iraq and then later Afghanistan as a civilian. I went over to Iraq to help them manage reconstruction projects all around the country. So I worked on that. I was at the State Department. Uh, I was at the embassy in Baghdad for six months and then moved over to the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, I was with them for uh, a year, and that was more, much more hands-on role for me and more fun. I got to get around the country, see what was going on. Um, it was uh, a huge challenge, but um, that was one where I thought, when I got there, I thought, they, uh, this country can't stand on its own two feet. And a year and a half later, when I was leaving, I was thinking, this country stand, can stand on their own two feet if they really want to. So that was a big change. Well, certainly your value of accepting and leaning into challenge came back into play because it sounds like <laughs> every step of your career got more challenging and you had to push yourself even more. Yeah. Yeah. And when I was over in Iraq, I was uh, doing things that I'd never done in the in the Navy, but the things that I had learned in managing programs in the Navy enabled me to manage these reconstruction projects in, in Iraq. And while you were there, you were, I think you call it diplomacy through art. You were sketching and leaving some of your art behind with some of the people you met. Was that fulfilling for you? And, and that's ultimately this whole project is where you ended up in the Smithsonian, right? It is. Like I said, I was in Iraq for a year and a half, and then I came home for about a year. And then for kind of the same reasons that I went to Iraq, I went off to Afghanistan this time. You know, I, I think in both cases, it was, this is an important job. It's something that this country needs to make happen. You know, it need, our, our country needs for it to be a success. And maybe I can play a small role in that. You know, I've got the I've got a background that can contribute. So that's how I went to Iraq and also to Afghanistan. I think it, with Afghanistan, it was like, well, let's go see what this other one's like. Um, so I went to Afghanistan in 2011 and was over there for a year with the State Department again. And this was where I really had the opportunity to get out and work with Afghans. Uh, and that was kind of um, what I really wanted to do, you know, when I was going through the training with the State Department uh, before going over, 
I was telling her, get me away from the embassy. You know, I want to go out in the sticks. I want to see, I want to work with the Afghans. And so I wound up in Kandahar province uh, and then way out in a small district and would meet with the, with the Afghans, the district leaders and businessmen and, and so forth. And try, the goal was to help them get their procedures um, down and, you know, try to reduce corruption, ha, huh? and, um, uh, you know, make them to where they could help them get to where they could self-sustain um, and resist the Taliban. And uh, while I was sitting in these meetings with the Afghans, you know, uh, if I participated in the meetings a lot, of, most of the time, then uh, something was terribly wrong. This was Afghan-led meetings solving Afghan problems. So I would be sitting over to the side or in the back uh, taking notes, and usually I had my little sketch pad with me, or I'd just be drawing on the line paper in the little government issue notebook that they gave us, because these Afghans had these tremendous faces. You know, they, there's so much character in them, and I just loved listening to them and seeing them, and so I would just just sketch them. Sometimes I would give them the, the drawings, you know, after the meeting was over I'd, and they were always very well received. They got a kick out. It was like, Oh my gosh, you drew me. That's me. <laughs> so it was, so that was very rewarding. I wasn't doing it with the idea that, you know, this is going to be something. I was just doing it to keep myself enter- entertained while they were talking in Pesto and I didn't understand a word of what they were saying and, and so forth. So uh, after I came back, I had, you know, just stacks of drawings. And so I talked with, with my former teachers at UNCA and they were very interested in, in seeing them. So uh, we put on a show at UNCA and then next thing I know, we got it uh, traveling around to other schools. And we had about, eh, what, 50 to 60, something like that. And I decided that now, these drawings really need to stay together because it shows a moment in our history. And so I was trying to figure out, well, what, are, what am I going to do with these things? And then another artist friend of mine uh, had his drawings accepted uh, into the Smithsonian. So I thought, oh, maybe they would be interested in this. So I sent him a, a note and uh, pointed him at the website and said, you know, here's these drawings. You think you guys might want them? And, and they said, yeah. So uh, I got to go up to DC and hand over uh, all these drawings to them. And then I got to see the storage room where they keep that and all their uh, combat art. You know, it's just, it was just amazing. What was that like for you as an artist? And the fact that you did it in DC, there's something about all of your background and professional career kind of coming together in this artist moment. Also in D.C., the government capital, military capital of America. Was it overwhelming for you? Were you like, what am I doing here? Or did it all kind of make sense for you? There was a bit of that. Oh, my gosh, my my work is in here with these guys. You know, um, a little bit of the, you know, imposter syndrome there. And, but uh, it was really, it was exciting, really exciting to, to see, see the work and know that, that these drawings are going to stay together and they're going to be well taken care of going into the future. So, you know, here's, here's some of my work that will outlast me. That's pretty cool. Super cool. So do you think, and this is probably a question you're never supposed to ask an artist, but I've never interviewed an artist before, so you can forget, (laughs) you know, I don't know what I'm doing. Do you think that your best work has happened or is your best work to come artistically? Mm. Oh, that's a tough question. I don't know. I do know that I consider some of my drawings from Afghanistan to be really good. I think the best painting that I've ever done, I did back in maybe 2005, 2006. It's a painting on my website called Warrior. And it's a, a life-size painting of a, of a soldier in a wheelchair with no legs. 
And that one really just hit all the buttons that I was aiming for. And right now that one is hanging up in my, in my studio where I see it every day because it's like a challenge. Here's, here's the best thing you've done. Top this. And that was, back, like I said, uh, what, 14 years? I haven't topped it yet. <laughs> but I'm trying. I'm trying. But that's a super cool mindset. And really, I love the pushing yourself and putting the best thing you've ever done up on the wall and saying, all right, let's see if we can beat this <laughs> and and keep going. I mean, the thing that I, I really appreciated about your answer is you, you, did, you don't know, is your best work to come or has your best work happened? But you're still working. You're still seeing how your voice is going to be expressed into the world. And that's, it's the work is never done. The passion is never done, which is fantastic. Because now talk a little bit about what you're doing now, because you've figured out a way to make money and do your passion. <laughs> yeah, this is another one of those diversions from going to the mailbox. I, I was in the, in the studio one day and I get a call from somebody this lady who's saying, my sister's getting married over here in Tennessee in October, and would you be her live wedding painter? And I was telling her, oh, okay, sure, yes, yes, I can do that. I, I'd love to do that. And then I'm immediately on, on, the, on Google going, what the hell is a live wedding painter? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Fake it till you make it, right? Yes, I can do that. I will figure it out when you're not watching me. I love that. <laughs> So I looked into it and I found out that live wedding painting is a thing. You know, uh, people will have an artist at their at their wedding, at their reception, painting a painting of uh, the couple and the event and all that. And so I, I thought about it like, huh, uh, is this something I want to do? And so I gave it a, uh, I did a test painting. And I thought this could be fun. And so I got into it and. And yeah, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you're at a wedding and this is one of the biggest moments in somebody's life that they've asked me to uh, record in paint. And so, you know, you're at a painting, everybody's all dressed up, they got the music on, everybody's having a great time, they're dancing, they're, you know, it's just, it, it's so much fun. And so many people have never seen an artist at work. And so I get a lot of people coming by and, and watching and, you know, I, I guess, as you can tell, I like to talk with people. And so I'll be happy to talk with, with them about what I'm doing and why and how and so forth. So I'll work at the reception and then take it, take the painting back to the studio and work on it for another two to four weeks before it's finally at the level that I want it to be at and then deliver it. So I didn't know that live wedding paintings was a thing either. <laughs> so I appreciate the education. I've seen artists do live paintings at galas and church services and that kind of thing, but I've never seen it at a wedding. But how smart, because there is something so different about when I was watching your looking at your website and seeing the pictures of the Afghans faces and thinking about how different that is and just what it picks up and expresses that a photograph can't. And the similar thing with a wedding photo is that there's beautiful photography that happens at weddings, but there's something more timeless and important, I guess, about art from that day. So I, I'm surprised it is a thing that you and I both hadn't heard about until me now and you <laughs> the first time you got hired. So that's fun. Yep. I love doing it. Well, I think we're at the mailbox, but I think in your life, the mailbox continues to move because your journey continues <laughs> to weave, you know, that's just the path of a life well lived. So as we get to the end, I want to ask the question that, that I ask everyone at the end of the podcast, which is, is there a quote or something that has motivated you as you've continued to flip your script? Yes, ma'am. And that was the one I mentioned earlier, the question from the artist consultant, what is it you really want to do? You hear a lot of people say, follow your passion, you know, follow your dreams. And to me, that's, to me, that is kind of shallow because it, in, in my mind, at least it, it conjures up, you know, uh, some starry eyed innocent going off in the world saying, follow your dreams and the money will follow. Well, no, it doesn't. The world doesn't work like that. 
but the uh, the question of what is it you really want to do forces you to look deep inside you know what is it that really motivates you at your core and when i heard that question i realized that i had asked myself that same question many times before and the answers that it gave me led me in some of these different side trips away from going to the mailbox. And it's something that I still ask myself, you know, that's, that was a question that led me to uh, going to Iraq and Afghanistan, which was what, you know, what can I, what do I really want to do about this particular situation? Here's a situation where I can contribute to a national goal, or I can continue to pursue uh, my own interests. And in those two cases, I decided to contribute to uh, to something else. And, and then I came back to the art. And by asking myself that question, I've also been able to rack and stack my priorities so that I know, okay, you know, uh, my family is my highest priority. And I know where my current other income producing activities stack up and my artwork stacks up. So, you know, it, it enabled me to prioritize my life. So that is a question that I think has helped me out and maybe might help others. Thank you for sharing that. And what I love about the way that you described it there is that you ask the question, but you have to keep asking it because had you not kept asking it, your career would have been over years ago and you might not be walking into the studio looking at the warrior and thinking, you know what, I want to beat this today. <laughs> and that just makes all of us better to have that mindset. Keep asking the question. It's it's nothing that ever dies. You don't hit a certain age and say, well, all right, I'm, I'm done. Uh, that just isn't, that's not the path. It might be the straightest path to the mailbox, but it certainly is not the most rewarding. That is very true. You got to keep asking it. Thank you, Skip. It was a joy talking with you. And, and as people have heard what I, what I want you to pick up, there's a few things there, at least that stuck out for me, is to practice your passion. Don't ever let something that for a season in your life that you have to put off to the side, don't let it die. Push yourself and make pushing yourself and challenging yourself something that's your normal. And is there something that you've set aside that you thought needed to be pushed off to the side that you need to revisit because you're going to keep asking yourself, what is it that you want to do? And what I love about Skip's story is everyone has a passion. And if you're really lucky, you can get paid for your passion and you can leave a long lasting legacy. My hope is that Skip's story empowers you to believe you're capable of more than you think, to discover motivation, to uncover inspiration, and to find the strength to turn the page. Thank you for listening to Flip Your Script, hosted by Christy Peel and produced by Media Minefield. If you like our message, please be sure to give us a five-star rating, subscribe to the show, and share our episodes with your family and friends. Do you or someone you know have a story about flipping your script? We'd love to share it. Contact us on our website, flipyourscriptpodcast.com. To stay up to date on all things Flip Your Script, make sure to follow host Christy Peel on social media. You can also check out the website for pictures, resources mentioned in the show, and other great episodes.